May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? I'm Dr. Thomas Michel, professor at Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Now, there's no need to worry, but we need to make you aware of a situation. Someone sitting in this audience is covered with bacteria. Now, if you are sitting next to that person, there is no cause for alarm. Because you see, every person in this audience is covered with bacteria. Ladies and gentlemen, and microbes, welcome to the 20th first annual Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. In just a moment, the new Ig Nobel Prize winners will arrive. All the Nobel laureates, the past Ig Nobel Prize winners, the 24-7 lecturers, and other ignitaries are here on stage awaiting them. Now, here they are. Please welcome the new Ig Nobel Prize winners. Just like preschool. Now, it is my honor to introduce our presiding monarchs. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the king and queen. Their majesties, the king and queen of Swedish meatballs. Uh, you may be seated. Oh, uh, wait, 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 wait. They didn't say yet. Uh, uh, up, up, up. Uh, no, 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 okay, you can stay down. I'm Karen Hopkin, creator of the Stud Muffins of Science calendar. I'm also the creator of Christopher, who, uh, who this evening uh, comes to show you his own personal collection of bacteria. <laughs> we welcome you to this year's Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. We're gathered here tonight at Sanders Theater at Harvard University. And tonight, on this very special International Translation Day, I am looking toward a microphone and expecting my translators will appear there. And there they are. Because this evening, the proceedings will be simultaneously translated into Dutch and simultaneously translated into Japanese. And simultaneously translated into Chinese. And simultaneously translated into the language of love. Oh, mon chéri, what love? And now, the grand introduction of the delegations, led by the exalted Grand High Panjandrum of Delegations, Louise Sacco. As we introduce each delegation, it will make its presence known by standing up and twirling in place three times counterclockwise. Please. <laughs> Greet them all with the respect they deserve. Now let's begin the introductions. First, marching in, we have the Texans for the Advancement of Poor Hygienic Practices. 
Stop, stop the germicide, just say no nope to soap. And we have the University of Chicago Mutations of the Midway. <laughs> Harvard, the Harvard Computer Society. And marching this evening, Harvard's Microbial Sciences Initiative, cheering for the bacteria. lights up here, man. <laughs> he says he can't hear. And we also have the Google Viral and Bacterial Advertising Team. <laughs> we'll get one later. The, the Harvard School of Public Health TB Team, fighting TB since 1922. Note that TB is still here. Um, <laughs> Also, marching this evening, the Museum of Bad Art, bringing the worst of art to the widest of audiences. And now on Facebook. And we have the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute because robots make better friends than bacteria. <laughs> the Harvard Society of Physics Students. And then marching in, the Third East Traveling Animal Zoo Delegation. Harvard class of 78, honorary carriers of MRSA. <laughs> and now, uh, a brief announcement, Boston Mensa, a regular at this ceremony, isn't here this year. They couldn't figure out how to buy tickets in time. <laughs> we hope they figure out how to watch the webcast. Marching in this evening, the Society for the Preservation of Slide Rules. This is a lot of crazy stuff. The Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association. The area librarian celebrating bacteria's freedom to breed. <laughs> and finally, marching in, the SPAA, a bacteriologically inclusive delegation that can be described as panphilic. They are the, they are the so, societas pro agnitio, aqua, fizino, fibro, bactero, firmicu, plankto, miso, chryso, geno, cyano, thermo, chloro, proteos, pyrico, pliabo, bisoverico, microbiome. SPAA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, literati, glitterati, pseudo-intellectuals, quasi-pseudo-intellectuals, and gram-negative bacillococci, may I introduce our master of ceremonies, the editor of the Annals of Improbable Research, Chief Airhead, Mark Abrams. Thank you. We are gathered here tonight to honor some remarkable individuals and groups. Every winner has done something that first makes people laugh and then makes them think. 
The Ig Nobel Prize ceremony is produced by the Science Humor magazine, The Annals of Improbable Research, and the Ig is proudly co-sponsored by the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, the Harvard Radcliffe Society of Physics Students, and the Harvard Computer Society. Tonight, 10 prizes will be given. The achievements speak all for themselves, all too eloquently. The editors of the Annals of Improbable Research have chosen a theme for this year's ceremony. That theme is bacteria. Let me introduce now a few of the several hundred people who are here sitting on our stage. First, our Nobel laureates. Uh, 1979 Nobel laureate in physics from Boston University and Harvard University, Sheldon Glashow. A 2005 Nobel laureate in physics, and a man who for more than a decade has humbly swept paper airplanes from this stage during the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony from Harvard, Roy Glauber. And his broom. Uh, 2004 Nobel Laureate in Physics from MIT, Frank Wilczek. Uh, 1985 Nobel Laureate in Peace from Infrared X, James Muller. Uh, 1976 Nobel Laureate in Chemistry from Harvard University. He's about to celebrate his 91st birthday, Colonel William Lipscomb. Uh, 1990 Nobel Laureate in Physics from MIT, Jerome Friedman. Uh, was, as usual, was prevented from joining us. Here he is by video. Congratulations. I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. Thank you, Professor Friedman. Now, let us meet some of the other authority figures who are here on our stage. The performing chemists. The band, Nick Karstoyu and Deborah henson Conant. More introductions, the human spotlights. The Human Curtain Rods. Bow Curtain Rods. The official keepers of the mop. The keepers of the mop will sweep detritus from our stage. Sylvia Rosenberg and Roy Glauber. Our control and command elements, the Ig Nobel referee, Mr. John Barrett. For those worried about sex and violence, our V-chip monitor will attempt to block anything offensive from reaching your eyes, ears, or if you're watching on the internet, your fingertips. Here is our V-chip monitor, noted New York attorney, William J. Maloney. Mr. Mr. Maloney, would you, would you please demonstrate your displeasure? Thank you. As you know, we used to have a problem at the Ig Nobel ceremony with uh, people who would exceed their time limits when they were giving speeches. Here's how we now solve that problem. Please welcome the charming, ever so cute, Miss Sweetie Poo. <laughs> Miss Sweetie Poo. Miss Sweetie Poo is eight years old. Miss Sweetie Poo, would you please demonstrate what you'll do when someone exceeds his or her allotted time? Please stop. I'm bored. Please stop. I'm bored. Please 
Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Now, thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Now, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you, Miss Sweetie Poo. Thank you. There are other important people up here. You will meet them later. Uh, special hello to everyone watching live from internet parties, uh, especially the people in Philadelphia and Copenhagen and other cities. Hello. Uh, we are being webcast live thanks to generous support from the Harvard Extension School and also Google and also the Harvard Law School Media Services. Thank you all of you for the help. The ceremony will later be broadcast on uh, National, Talk, National Public Radio's Talk of the Nation Science Friday program with Ira Flato. That, <laughs> it will go to his head. <laughs> that will be on the day after Thanksgiving. And a special thanks to our great supporters this year, Google and Ecolab. Thank you very much. And now, now Professor Jean Burko Gleason will deliver the traditional Ig Nobel welcome, welcome speech. Time for some music. Evelyn, Evelyn will perform a special brief microbial mini concert. Evelyn, Evelyn will be accompanied by their bacteria. Please welcome, welcome Evelyn, Evelyn. Um, Evelyn and Evelyn would like to know if you would like them, like to pl them to play you a song. Would you still like it if it's about elephants? They want me to tell you that um, they want you to help them sing this song. When they sing the word elephant, you sing the word elephant too. <laughs> After they do. Or a word that rhymes with elephant. Intelligent. 
how could I feel blue? I've got my sister at my side And an elephant to ride with. Elephant, elephant You're sat in a cage, but that's irrelevant Irrelevant Cause everyone is jealous when they see me riding by On a friend of such great size Other kids have bikes That's true Or daddies pick them up from school But that won't do for me Understand. Understand. Other kids have horses. Other kids have dogs. Other kids have hamsters. Other kids have frogs. But the pet for me is something much more grand. Suspicious about the government. <laughs> and I've got an elephant. Elephant. Riding on your back, I'm in my element. Element. It's true and it's a fact. There is so much you can learn when you're on a pack of dirt. Oh, elephant. Elephant. Life's not so bad, it's swell of it to give me such a friend. Oh, elephant. Elephant. I'm with you to the end. This is shocking. They have another song. Um, but, but this is a very, very special song. It's completely brand new, and they... They wrote it today for the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony. Okay, this is a totally, completely, utterly, and in every way original, brand new song that nobody has ever heard before, ever. <laughs> and you're gonna do it now. Okay. If you want. Listeria. Listeria. <laughs> Salmonella, Streptococcus, everyone beware. There are microbes in the air. Bacteria. Bacteria. Don't eat the shellfish in the cafeteria. Cafeteria. And wash your hands whenever you touch money, poop, or worms. Got to kill those nasty germs. My best friend got she died. Another girl got thrush inside. That's not all the things that you can get. You can get. Some people get ulcers. Some get bloody lungs. Some people get acne. Some just get the runs. Or some 
undocumented and exotic, extremely malignant pathogen from Siberia or Nigeria or from right here -ia. There's so much bacteria, bacteria, you might get gangrene, anthrax, or diphtheria, diphtheria, or salmonella, whooping cough, or catch bubonic plague. Golly germs are such a drag. Bacteria, bacteria, they all meet these criteria. They're deadly, bad, and gross. Bacteria, bacteria, we're all potential hosts. Bacteria, bacteria, we're all Ladies and gentlemen, Evelyn Evelyn. <laughs> Evelyn, Evelyn, and their friends, Amanda Palmer, Jason Webley, and Neil Gaiman. We are honored to have with us tonight several past winners of the Ig Nobel Prize. Each returning winner will express his or her sentiments about the occasion concisely. We've asked them to limit their words to one Twitter tweet, 140 <laughs> characters maximum. Referee John Barrett will enforce the uh, speech limit. And please welcome them one at a time. The 2004 Ig Nobel Prize in Psychology was awarded to the team that discovered that when people pay close attention to one thing, they can easily overlook anything else, even a woman in a gorilla suit. Please welcome Christopher Chabri. Gorillas are harder to see than we realize intuitively, but if you just took a close look at our book, The Invisible Gorilla, you'd see your mind much more clearly. Christopher Chabri. The 2008 Ig Nobel Prize in Cognitive Science was awarded to the team who discovered that slime mold can solve puzzles. Please welcome Toshiyuki Nakagaki and Atsushi Tero. First, we found the slime world can be a navigator. And this time, we found that the slime world can be a transport planner. So we are back. <laughs> Atsushi Taro and Toshiyuki Nakagaki. The 1976 Ig Nobel Prize in Art was awarded to the creator of the plastic pink flamingo. Please welcome Don Featherstone and his wife, Nancy Featherstone. The plastic pink flamingo is the only animal fully protected from bacteria. So feel free to give them to all your friends. It's good for business. Don Featherstone. The 2006 Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine went to the author of the study Termination of intractable hiccups with digital rectal massage. <laughs> Please welcome the man and his finger, Dr. Francis Fezmeyer.
Tis pleasure to return to my alma mater, class of 81, bacteria. I have just one question. What did N. gonorrhea say to the hiccuping strep fecalis? Bend over and take it like a bacteria. Dr. Francis Fesmeyer, the 2008 Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine went to the team who demonstrated that high-priced fake medicine is more effective than low-priced fake medicine. Please welcome the team leader, Dan Ariely. I, I never listen to instructions, so I'm not going to do this 140 characters. I feel that I deserve the Ig Nobel every year. <laughs> and this year I deserved it for showing that bankers cheat more than politicians. <laughs> Dan Ariely, the 2003 Ig Nobel Prize in Biology, celebrated the world's first scientific report of homosexual necrophilia in the Mallard Duck. Please welcome Case Muliker. It's uh, good to be back here. Thanks to winning the egg in 2003 for reporting homo necrosex in ducks, Two new cases have come to my attention. <laughs> you can read about it in my book. <laughs> Case Mulliker. We have one other returning winner. She has a special announcement. The one tweet limit does not necessarily apply to her. The 2009 Ig Nobel Prize in Public Health was awarded to the inventor of a brassiere that in an emergency can be quickly converted into a pair of protective face masks. Please welcome Dr. Elena Bodnar. Are we prepared tonight to protect ourselves from bacteria? <laughs> and gentlemen, just look around. Many of you are sitting tonight next to emergency bra wearer who may choose to save you from bacteria. <laughs> or she may not. <laughs> so don't miss my MIT lecture where I'm going to present my new invention for men. <laughs> Well, it has been one year since my prototype demonstration on this stage. And with a lot of work and many improvements, here I am again, proud that my emergency bra is now available for everyone. It is an effective, economical, and always readily available personal protective device. But first and foremost, it is a beautiful piece of lingerie. <laughs> Each Nobel laureate have uh, received uh, as a gift tonight the emergency bra. So I call them all, I'm calling them all on the stage next to me to complete the final requirement for certification is an emergency bra user. <laughs> Gentlemen, when I say bacteria, I would like you to rapidly remove your bras, quickly <laughs> convert it into face mask, and apply one of them on your face. Are you ready? Ready. Are we ready? <laughs> bacteria! Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> well, just look at them. They really know what they're doing. <laughs> Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, now I present the first class graduating class of the certified emergency bra users. Certificate presented for completion of training in efficient operation of bra clasps and rapid bra removal as well as fundamentals of garment wearing, caring, and sharing. They can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Elena Bodnar and her bra. And I'm delighted to announce we have, by special arrangement, one other returning Ig Nobel Prize winner. Uh, in addition to the thing that won him the Ig Nobel Prize, he has been prolific. He is the most prolific inventor in the history of Japan with more than 3,000 patents. A 2005 Ig Nobel Prize in Nutrition was awarded to him for photographing and retrospectively analyzing every meal he had eaten for more than 34 years. Please welcome Dr. Nakamatsu. First invention was age of five. My number of invention, including bacteria, is 3,368, compared with Thomas Edison's 1,093. The number is still increasing. <laughs> Dr. Nakamatsu. Tonight's keynote speech on the topic bacteria will be given by Richard Losick, the Harvard College professor, and Maria Moores, Cabot professor of biology at Harvard University. Please welcome the man and his bacteria, Rich Losick. Hello. Many of you brought a guest or two this evening, or thought you did. I'm here to tell you that all of you brought a hundred trillion guests. These are the bacteria that live in our body. There are 10 times more of them than there are human cells in the body. And they contain a hundred times more genes than all the genes in the human genome. These bacteria influence whether you're lean or obese, whether your immune system is developed properly. And consider this, they communicate with each other chemically and undoubtedly with their human host as well, perhaps influencing our behavior. Was it your decision to come tonight, or was it this? <laughs> Lastly, let me share with you the secret to health, wealth, and happiness, which is to stay in touch with your inner microbiome. Can, can you hear that? Daniel, can, can, you, can you help me? Oh, per permit me to translate. They're saying, please stop. We're bored. We're bored. <laughs> Thank you. Rich Losek. Oh. 
We almost forgot the human beings at giantmicrobes.com sent us some giant microbes, and we decided to uh, give them to the Nobel laureates. And now, let's, let's get it over with. Ladies and gentlemen, the awarding of the 2010 Ig Nobel Prizes. We're giving out 10 prizes. The winners come from many nations. This year's winners have truly earned their prizes. Karen, tell them what they've won. Thank you, Mercer Muffin. This year's winners each receive an Ig Nobel Prize. And uh, what else did they get? Oh, um, a piece of paper saying they've won an Ig Nobel Prize. <laughs> Any distinguishing marks on the paper? Uh, it's signed by several Nobel laureates. Okay. And ooh, it's covered in bacteria. Oh, how nice! How nice. <laughs> this, this is the coveted Ig. Nobel Prize. We have, uh, we have never had money to award to the Ig Nobel Prize winners, but this is the 20th year of the Ig Nobel Prizes, and a generous benefactor has stepped forth. This year, each winning team will be given $10 trillion, 10 a, ten, a genuine 10 trillion Zimbabwe dollar bill. Please welcome our generous benefactor. Thank you, good sir. And now, our winners. First, the Engineering Prize. This year's Engineering Prize is awarded to Karina Acevedo Whitehouse and Agnes Rocha Gosselin of the Zoological Society of London, UK, and Diane Gendron of Instituto Politecnico Nacional in Baja California Sur, Mexico, for perfecting a method to collect whale snot using a remote control helicopter. <laughs> Here are Karina Acevedo Whitehouse, Agnes Rocha Gosselin, and Diane Gendron. Thank you. I would have liked I would have liked to start this speech by saying, ever since I can remember, I wanted to be a whale snot catcher. <laughs> it's not really true, but I did always want to study wildlife disease. In 2003, in the Marine Mammal Conference, we started uh, thinking about surveying uh, whale health and free-living whales. So I was thinking, whales do smell bad. And they do, uh, and discussing it, we thought maybe, it's, uh, maybe it might have something to do with the infection. My knowledge of whale fieldwork was virtually zero, so I naively proposed inserting a swab into the whale's blowhole to look for bacteria. And Diane laughed very hard. Well, while, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> while discussing, I remember that in the field, uh, the spout or the blow of the whale would come to our face and to our glasses. So Karina and mine just started running. And at that moment, she, we started discussing idea about hanging out the boat using an extendable pole or several ID were tested. And finally, we thought, if sampling the blowhole directly is not doable, why not use a remote-controlled helicopter? How else can you sample the largest living mammal in, without touching it? So it took some planning, enrolling courageous graduate student Agnès Rocha, a lot of persuasion to buy the helicopter, but we finally proved you can do it. Thank you. The Medicine Prize. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize is awarded this year to Simon Ritveld of the University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and Ilya van Beest of Tilburg University for discovering that 
symptoms of asthma can be treated with a roller coaster ride. <laughs> Here are Simon Rittfeld and Ilya von Bass. Thank you. We have always too long to ride a roller coaster, but Ilya here was too scared, and I couldn't bring my seeing eye dog in a roller coaster. <laughs> and then we had the chance to go to a local amusement park with a group of 40 young women, most of them patients with chronic severe asthma, and we used several roller coaster rides to induce emotions. And from that, we learned that negative emotions before the roller coaster are associated with breathlessness, even in patients without any airway obstruction. We also learned that positive emotions after the roller coaster are associated with a lack of breathlessness, even in patients with a confirmed attack of airway obstruction. These findings may have dramatic implications for use of medication because asthma patients tend to overuse medication during negative emotions but they tend to underuse medication during positive emotions. A less dramatic implication of our research is that we now love roller coasters. Thanks again for this highly improbable award. Now here is a musical treat, the world premiere of a new mini opera called The Bacterial Opera. There are four acts, one act now, three acts later. The opera is staged and conducted by maestro David Stockton. It stars Maria Ferrante, Ben Sears, Roberta Gilbert, and Mark Andelman, with Thomas Michel on accordion and pianist Brandon Grimmett. And now here is our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Thank you, my chlamydial cupcake. Tonight's opera stars several trillion bacteria and, and one human being, a woman. The action takes place on one tooth inside that woman's mouth. The woman, as you can see, is asleep on a chair with her mouth hanging open. We've arranged a sort of microscope so you can see her microbial friends. Let's take a look. Um, will one of the technicians please turn on the microscope? Ah, there they are, magnified so very much that, believe it or not, these teeny tiny little widow bacteria appear to be the same size as the human being. <laughs> Isn't that a hoot? The main characters are called Kirkusbachacacus, Sidekickacacus, Galileocacus, and Accordionacacus. And here in Act One, Kirkusbachacacus and Sidekickacacus will explain why they hate being stuck their whole lives on this tooth. But you know and I know that what they really hate is all the many, many other bacterial species in their crowded neighborhood. Let's listen to them gripe.
with neighbors who hurt and mock us. Let's name names, let's tell the whole truth, let's name the scum on this tooth. I'm your uh, VGIP monitor. Thank you. Uh, it's almost time, and I emphasize almost by saying it louder almost time to throw your paper airplanes. Now, remember, remember what's most important safety, accuracy, recycling, and safety, and bacteria. Now, if you have skill at throwing paper airplanes, I want you to please aim at the recycling target, not at the people, not at me, at the uh, human uh, aerodrome, uh, which is uh, right over there. <laughs> Everyone else, at least try to aim at the human aerodrome. OK, now get ready to throw. On your mark, get set, throw. Uh, the, accuracy, the accuracy is not quite what it could be. I'm sure there's a way we could uh, improve on that. Don't worry, we'll, uh, we'll come up with something. <laughs> Thank you, you may cease. Now please, thank you, thank you musicians. We, uh, thank you musicians, thank you. Please give your attention to Nobel Laureate Frank Wilczek. Please join me in a moment of science.
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished microbes, this first slide is not bacteria. This slide is one micron beads to calibrate your eyes to size and Brownian motion. Everyone calibrated. <laughs> Raise your hands if you need calibration. We'll send someone to help you, sir. Now may I present E. coli. Any moment now, E. coli. Transportation Planning Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Transportation Planning this year goes to Toshiyuki Nakagaki, Atsushi Taro, Seiji Takaki, Tetsu Saigusa, Kentaro Ito, Kenji Yumiki, and Ryo Kobayashi of Japan, and Dan Beber and Mark Fricker of the UK for using slime mold to determine the optimal routes for railroad tracks. Please note the following are co-winners both of this year's prize in this field and in 2008 when they were awarded an Ig Nobel Prize for demonstrating that slime molds can solve puzzles. Those two-time winners are Toshiyuki Nakagaki, Ryo Kobayashi, and Atsushi Taro. Here are Toshiyuki Nakagaki, Kentaro Ito, Atsushi Taro, Mark Fricker, and Dan Beber. Two, three, four. The three, four. slime mold is back. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, certainly. Okay. I have a letter from slime molds. Yeah. I will read. Okay. Feel the fizzle. I may only be an amoeba, an animal cell, not a mold. But for many long years, I have been bored to tears, just crawling around in the cold. I was looking for more of a challenge. Then I was captured and put in a dish and fed porridge oats by some scientist robots who set me problems to solve with some relish. It turns out I have quite talent. For finding the shortest path, or the solving a maze was only a phase. My real skill is building a graph. Tokyo was really quite easy, although Boston is rather mess. <laughs> So despite all your brains, when it comes down to trains, my networks are sure to impress. Thank you for your attention. It's time for act two of the bacterial opera. Here's our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Thank you, my streptococcal schmoopy. Among the billions of bacteria on this crowded tooth, there is a great scientist, a truly great scientist, a microbe named Galileo Caucus. <laughs> Galileo Caucus has just invented the telescope. Here's how he did it. As you know, the bacteria that live on teeth produce a kind of slime. 
You probably call it a biofilm or even the matrix of excreted polymeric compounds, but it's slime. One day, Galileo Caucus buried deep down into that slime, and from down there, he looked back up through the slime toward the light. The slime acted as a lens, a sort of telescope, and looking through that telescope, Galileo Caucus saw things that, until that moment, microbes believed were merely myths and legends. He saw human beings. And when he focused the telescope, he saw that those human beings are covered with, uh-huh, bacteria. <laughs> Alien bacteria. Let's, let's watch now as Galileo Caucus tells his fellow tooth bacteria that they are not alone in the universe. My fellow microbes, listen, I have got a new machine. It's called a telescope. It's called the telescope. Now we can look at distant things that we have never seen. Just look through the telescope. Look through the telescope. I found this telescope by going deep into the slime that we all make from schmutz that we secrete from time to time. Then I gazed back up toward the sky and through that slimy lens, I saw some human beings. I saw Homo sapiens. Then I saw something better so good I can hardly cope. It filled me full of hope. Now I am full of hope. Scientific dope, now we are filled with hope. Tell us what you saw, you dope, in that damn telescope. I saw bacteria in far off places. I saw their faces. They look quite friendly. They live in domiciles on human creatures lodged in the features that are uncleanly. Beneath the toenails, inside the entrails, under the armpits where it is moist. It must be moist. Oh, it must be moist. Nice human real estate in such variety fosters society among the microbes. All the best neighborhoods have some concavity. You want depravity? Go live on earlobes. Caudral and rostral, anus and nostril, stomach and Where it is moist, it must be moist. Nobel Physics Prize this year is awarded to Leanne Parkin, Sheila Williams, and Patricia Priest of the University of Otago, New Zealand, for demonstrating that on icy footpaths in wintertime, people slip and fall less often if they wear socks on the outside of their shoes. <laughs> Here is Leanne Parkin. Um, we're delighted to uh, accept this useful looking item. Um, our lighthearted study uh, arose out of a tea room conversation one icy morning, um, and we certainly did a lot of laughing and some thinking during the course of our research. 
As to why we did it, well, on one or two days every winter, um, the residents of our city are faced with a seemingly intractable problem, namely how to negotiate very steep streets, um, which are icy, uh, without falling over and breaking something. And historically, some enterprising individuals have uh, worn socks over their shoes, but at the time of our um, tea room conversation, there was no good evidence to support this um, off-label use of socks. <laughs> so, as public health academics, we uh, naturally felt obliged to conduct a proper evaluation of the socks over shoes intervention. So, we undertook a randomised control trial, a rigorous randomised control trial, and we found that sock-enhanced footwear, such as this pair, um, really did provide better traction on steep and icy slopes than unmodified footwear. Therefore, we would like to suggest that you too consider applying a pair of socks to your shoes next time you encounter icy conditions. Thank you. Now get set for the 24-7 lectures. We have invited several of the world's top thinkers to tell us very briefly what they are thinking about. Each 24-7 lecturer will explain his or her subject twice. First, a complete technical description in 24 seconds. And then, after a brief pause, a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. The 24-second time limit will be enforced by our referee, Mr. John Barrett. Now, Let's have the 24-7 lectures. Will the lab technicians bar the doors? Okay. The first 24-7 lecture will be delivered by Toshiyuki Nakagaki, professor of complex and intelligent systems at Future University Hakodate, and two-time Ig Nobel Prize winner, his topic, slime mold. First, a complete technical description of the subject in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Oh, go. Okay. Yes, uh, slime molds looks like uh, just a spread of uh, mustard and mayonnaise, but it uh, is well organized uh, as, a, as an organism. So slime molds can solve, solve puzzles and find the shortest connection path in the maze, and uh, slime molds uh, can anticipate periodic environmental events. And uh, slime molds, oh, yes, okay. And now, <laughs> a clear yes. summary okay. that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, okay. get set, go. The blob we shouldn't look down upon. Yes. <laughs> the next 24-7 lecture will be delivered by Mary Ellen Davey, research biologist at the Department of Molecular Genetics at the Forsyth Institute. Her topic, oral bacteria. First, a complete technical summary in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. There is an extremely complex community of organisms that live in the oral cavity. In order to survive, they must attach. They tend to attach along the gum line on the tooth. Here, they make a tenacious extracellular polysaccharide matrix that holds them together and protects them, thus creating dental plaque. A clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, A, a sticky, slimy, structured medley of microbes. The final 24-7 lecture will be delivered by Neil Gaiman, author of, author of The Sandman, Coraline, and quite a few other things, uh, winner of three Hugo Awards, two Nebula Awards, and quite a few other things. His topic, writer identification. First, a complete technical summary in 24 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. 
Whenever you're in doubt as to whether the thing on the back of the book jacket is a writer or a bacterium, given a human population of six billion people and positing that no more than half of them are published writers, that gives us a maximum of three billion writers. There are about five nonillion bacteria on this planet, so the chances of a random life form on the back of the book jacket being a bacterium and not a writer are roughly three sextillion to one. And now a clear summary that anyone can understand in seven words. On your mark, get set, go. It's probably a bacterium, not a writer. <laughs> the Peace Prize. The Ig Nobel Peace Prize this year is awarded to Richard Stevens, John Atkins, and Andrew Kingston of Keele University, UK, for confirming the widely held belief that swearing relieves pain. Here is Richard Stevens. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, a peace prize for swearing or cursing. It may seem strange, but the neurologist Hewlings Jackson once said, he, the first stone of civilization was laid when first someone insulted rather than bludgeoned to death their fellow man. <laughs> okay, swearing. First words, ask a midwife. Last words, listen to a black box recorder on a plane that went down. <laughs> Emotional words, I was interested in swearing as a response to pain. It was a very, it's a very common response to pain, but there have been no previous proper controlled experiments. So my students and I over the last few years devised a kind of a methodology. We give people a pain challenge, put your hand in ice cold water. We get them to swear or say a neutral word. They keep their hand in the ice cold water for longer when they swear. That's what that uh, shows there. <laughs> It doesn't stand there. Um, our latest data, uh, is very interesting, we're trying to get it published, is we ask people how often they swear on a daily basis. People that don't swear very often get much more of a protective effect in the experiment than people who swear a lot who get hardly any effect. So there you go, swearing, it's useful, but don't overdo it. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have a demonstration. The V-chip monitor has called off the demonstration. Please give your attention to the writer of the Boston Globe's misconduct column, Robin Abrams. In the spirit of cooperation and friendliness between the species, will all of you please rise? Turn to someone you did not know when you came in, shake hands, and exchange bacteria. <laughs> Thank you. We ask, each of, we ask each of the bearded men in the audience, the bearded men in the audience, please remain standing. Everybody else, please sit down. You bearded men, Please remain standing for a bit. Permit everyone to admire your beards. <laughs> the Public Health Prize. <laughs> this year's Ig Nobel Public Health Prize is awarded to Manuel Barbato, Charles Matthews, and Larry Taylor of the Industrial Health and Safety Office 
Fort Detrick, Maryland, USA, for determining by experiment that microbes cling to bearded scientists. <laughs> The winner was unable to join us for health reasons. He sent us an acceptance speech. Here to read his acceptance speech is Gary Dreyfus. This one? With, with deepest gratitude, I accept this honor. A scientist challenged me when I told him he shouldn't have a beard in the laboratory. That's why we did the experiment. We had indications that beards were detrimental to the fit of face masks for chemical protection, but there wasn't any real information on protection against bacteria or other living organisms. There is nothing about this in the scientific literature. So we conducted our experiment to evaluate the hypothesis that a bearded man subjects his fa that a bearded man that a bearded man or woman <laughs> subjects his or her family and friends to risk of infection if his or her beard is contaminated by infectious microorganisms while he or she is working in a microbiological laboratory. We concluded that a bearded man or woman is more dangerous carrier than a clean-shaven man or woman because the beard is more resistant to cleansing and that anyone working with infectious microorganisms should wash his, his or her beard or clean-shaven face before going home. The fellow who challenged me did shave off his beard when we finished the experiment. Thank you. I am your uh, V-chip monitor. And uh, it's uh, almost time. Uh, to throw your uh, paper airplanes at the designated target. Um, and remember what's important. Uh, safety, accuracy, uh, recycling, uh, safety, and bacteria. Okay, now you can throw them. Thank you very much. There is a bearded man still standing over there and one over there. You may sit down if you like. Please give your attention to Nobel laureate James Muller. Uh, please join us in a moment of science.
it's time for Act Three of the Bacterial Opera. Please welcome our narrator, Karen Hopkin. Thank you, my treptonemal tiger. Having seen that they are not alone in the universe, the bacteria want to leave. Yes. They want to leave their detested home tooth and voyage off to make contact with those far distant microbes. They have a plan. They'll get all their neighbors, all the tooth bacteria, to reproduce madly. The bodies will pile up high, building a tower that will grow up into the heavens and eventually reach the distant places they see in the telescope. Let's eavesdrop as they prepare to boldly go where none of them has gone before. Oh, 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 oh,
imagine that's a bit what it's like to uh, have dyslexia. <laughs> the Economics Prize. This year's Economics Prize is awarded to the executives and directors of Goldman Sachs, AIG, Lehman Brothers, Bear, Stearns, Merrill Lynch, and Magnetar for creating and promoting new ways to invest money, ways that maximize financial gain and minimize financial risk for the world economy or for a portion thereof. The winners could not or would not join us tonight. The Chemistry Prize. The Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize this year is awarded to Eric Adams of MIT, Scott Sokolovsky of Texas A&M University, Stephen Masutani of the University of Hawaii, and BP, British Petroleum, for disproving the old belief that oil and water don't mix. <laughs> Here are Eric Adams, Scott Sokolovsky, and Stephen Masutani. Thank you. It's too bad that BP couldn't be with us. <laughs> but in their stead, and with no disrespect to either party, we bring you Steve. <laughs> Actually, we're all engineers who enjoy playing with water. Steve pours oil into water and watches it form small droplets. I've looked at how those droplets can be made smaller if you mix the oil with dispersants. And Scott's going to tell us how you put those droplets in the bottom of deep ocean and what happens to them. Yeah, if the uh, oceans were motionless, then the oil and some natural gas that comes out with it would rise quickly to the surface without mixing and would uh, not mix into the ocean. Yeah, I told you so. <laughs> However, the uh, experiments that we conducted and some field studies about 10 years ago show that ocean currents and density differences actually cause the small droplets to leave the plume and form large horizontal intrusions of a few hundred meters above the sea floor, and this is what was observed in the Gulf of Mexico. And I was wrong. Unbelievable. Oil <laughs> and water do mix? Uh, yes. Actually, it's probably better that the oil stays subsurface, where it can be degraded by microbial organisms, and keeping it subsurface also uh, keeps it away from marine life in the coastal margins. Well, then everything turned out well in the end. We did the right thing. Uh, maybe so. <laughs> Th thanks, guys. It's time for the big question. Three of the finest minds in the universe will answer a question that has plagued humanity for centuries. The question is, how many bacteria can dance on the head of a pin? Each thinker has 20 to 30 seconds to reveal the answer to the public. The time limits, these 20 to 30 seconds, will be enforced by Neil Gaiman and by Evelyn Evelyn. Each is equipped with a timing device. The uh, question is... <laughs> one at a time, please. They're, they're trying to demonstrate, I guess, that great minds think alike, but one at a time, please. The, the uh, question is, how many bacteria can dance on the head of a pin? Now, Nobel Prize winner Frank Wilczek will answer that question. On your mark, get set, go. Well, I've calculated it in advance. It's 4,273,194,771,666. There is a pin for which that is the number of bacteria that, <laughs> that can swim. 
or fewer. Thank you, Professor Wilczek. The question I remind you is how many bacteria can dance on the head of a pin? Now, Nobel Prize winner Sheldon Glashow will answer that question on your mark. Well, uh, get set. <laughs> You all right? Your on your mark, get set, go. Excellent. Uh, Frank did it the hard way, and uh, there's a much easier way making use of superstring theory. <laughs> now, there is a duality principle where very difficult problems like this one can be related to much simpler problems. <laughs> and it could The final and presumably very different approach to answering this question will be delivered by Ig Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Nakamatsu. The question I remind you is how many bacteria can dance on the head of a pin? On your mark, get set, go. You know there are many kinds of pin in the world. Therefore, they are kind of uh, head of pin. So I have invented my head of pin. <laughs> Number on my head is 3.20173 trillion. That is the answer. Our generous benefactor has again stepped forth and donated some prize money to be divided between the three of them. It's a $10 trillion bill. Gentlemen. It's time now for the win a date with a Nobel laureate contest. Here's Karen Hopkin to tell us about our winner. Thank you, my peptococcal pumpkin. Our beloved Bill Lipscomb has been with the eggs from the start, and tonight he's our prize. Be still my heart. William Lipscomb won the 1976 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his keen understanding of the forces of chemical attraction. <laughs> he also invented a branch of science that relies heavily on hindsight called retro spectroscopy. If you win tonight, you're in for the ride of your life. Happy birthday, Bill. We love you. Please give a warm win a date welcome to Bill Lipscomb. All right, let's see which lucky audience member will win a date with this Nobel laureate. Uh, when you entered the hall, you were given an attractive printed program. Please pick that up now and look through it. If your, yes, how it lights up a little bit, please. If your program contains a picture of French scientist Louis Pasteur playing with his food, then you've won a date. Come on down and collect your prize. <laughs> French scientist Louis Pasteur playing with his food, a picture thereof. If you have it, you're the winner. <laughs> Congratulations to you both. <laughs> the Management Prize. The Ig Nobel Prize in Management is awarded to Alessandro Pluccino, Andrea Rapisarda, and Cesar Garofalo of the University of Catania, Italy, for demonstrating mathematically that organizations 
would become more efficient if they promoted people at random. Alessandro Puccino, Andrea Reposarda, and Cesar Garofalo. <laughs> when we received the announcement of the prize, we were a bit confused. But on the other hand, it is very improbable that two theoretical physicists work in collaboration with social scientists, and it is also true that our study started really for fun. But then it became a more serious thing. Thus, we thought that our study fitted perfectly with the E.G. Nobel motto, research that makes people laugh and then think. And so we are honored to be here and accept your prize this evening. We will try to explain what we have done in a few words. In the late 60s, Lawrence Peter, a Canadian psychologist, advanced an apparently paradoxical principle. Every new member in a hierarchical organization climbs the hierarchy until he or she reaches his or her level of incompetence. From the Peter principle, it follows that incompetence spread over the entire organization since, in time, Every position stands to be occupied by an employee who is incompetent to carry out his duties. In our paper, we have demonstrated by numerical simulation the validity of the principle. But above all, we have found a possible, apparently paradoxical solution to avoid its negative effects. Adopt, Adopt random, random promotions. promotions. Many thanks. <laughs> Many thanks. And finally, the Biology Prize. The Ig Nobel Biology Prize this year is awarded to Li Biao Zhang, Min Tan, Guan Jian Zhu, Jen Ping Ye, Tiu Hong, Shan Yi Zhou, and Xu Yi Zhang of China, and Gareth Jones of the University of Bristol, UK, for scientifically documenting fellatio in fruit bats. Here is Gareth Jones. Thank you for this prize. I'm, I'm blown away. Bats are amazing mammals. They fly, they echolocate, they can tell us a lot about evolution. And that's where my interests mainly are. But as far, we, as far as we know, they're the only mammals, apart from humans as adults, who perform the behavior of fellatio. Now, just to show you how this works. <laughs> The V-chip monitor has terminated the demonstration. Thank you very much. <laughs> the winner has provided us with a video of the phenomenon. The V-chip monitor has terminated the video of the phenomenon. Thank you. you may be seated, yes. please. <laughs> Take your little friends with you, please. Thank you. Before we finish up,
Before we finish up with the triumphal handshaking of the winners and then the stirring grand finale of the opera, we remind you to join us this Saturday at MIT. The new winners and the returning winners will give free public talks to explain, if they can, what they did and why they did it. That's Saturday at 1 p.m. at MIT in room 10250. It's free. Now, before we finish up the evening with the conclusion of the opera, it's time for the triumphal handshaking with Professor Lipscomb. All the new Ig Nobel Prize winners will now emerge one by one through the sacred curtain there to receive a token handshake from Nobel laureate William Lipscomb. Let the emerging and the shaking begin. Now the, now the final act of the Bacterial Opera. Our singers and musicians will be joined by the Nobel laureates and some of the other distinguished people whom you see here on our stage. Here is our narrator now, Karen Hopkin. Thank you, my halo bacterial honey bun. And now for the thrilling conclusion to the Bacterial Opera. The bacteria are... Uh, they're feverishly reproducing, building a tower of bodies that will rise so high it transports them to a far distant place. One of the bacteria is about to sing her final excited goodbye to the tooth. But all this feverish activity is starting to awaken the sleeping woman, the woman whose tooth is the home planet for all these bacteria. Let's hope for the bacteria's sake that that this woman's not one of those people who thinks only about her own comfort and well-being. You know the kind I mean. Someone who would viciously brush, brush, brush her teeth and then mass murderously floss, floss, floss her teeth <laughs> and then, for overkill, gargle with mouthwash. For the sake of this woman's oral bacteria, let's hope she has more consideration than to do any of that. Anyway, before the woman wakes up, let's hear what her oral bacteria have to say about their upcoming journey.
Maria Ferrante, Ben Sears, Roberta Gilbert, Mark Andelman, Jenny Gutzbizal, accordionist Thomas Michelle, pianist Brandon Grimmen, maestro David Stockton. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor, G Beth, Professor Jean Burko Gleason will deliver the traditional Ig Nobel goodbye, goodbye speech. Please let's honor the many people who helped put this ceremony together. They're all over the hall, back there, back there, over here, downstairs. Would, would the Ig Nobel Prize winners and the Nobel Prize winners please gather at center stage for a pointless photo opportunity? Ladies and gentlemen, the Ig Nobel Prize winners and the Nobel Prize winners and the keynote speaker and the 24-7 speakers and our opera singers and everyone else. On behalf of the Harvard Radcliffe Society of uh, Physics Students and the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, and the Harvard Computer Society, and especially from all of us at the Annals of Improbable Research. Thanks for coming, and please remember this final thought. If you didn't win an Ig Nobel Prize this year, and especially if you did, better luck next year. Good night. <laughs>